I, now I would like to welcome um, Professor John Olnick, who will be speaking about recent developments with hemochromatosis. John has been a medical advisor to Hemochromatosis Australia for many years and has been of great assistance to us all. John is consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist at Fiona Stanley Hospital in Fremantle. He is the Dean of Clinical Research, School of Medical and Health Sciences at Edith Cowan University, as well as Health Research Theme Lead, Edith Cowan University, Western Australia. Over to you, Professor Olnick. All right. Good morning, uh, everybody. I think it's morning still in, in, in Australia everywhere. Uh, lovely to be with you. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we cover off on some really interesting things today. Uh, so without further ado, what I'm going to do is start screen sharing the presentation that I have and hopefully everything will start up all right. It seems to be at the moment. Um, and so this is the update that I'm going to provide, uh, which really covers off on things that have happened, so over the last four years that are relatively new in the field, or that highlight interesting points that I think uh, members of this organisation would be uh, keen on. So the first thing I want to do is talk about treatment. There's, we've known about phlebotomy treatment for a long time, but there's often been a debate as to should everybody uh, be treated irrespective of what their ferritin levels are? especially if you're a patient with a ferritin level that's uh, under a thousand but over what we call the upper end of the reference range, so elevated. Um, so a trial was conducted, uh, run out of uh, Melbourne, but involving multiple centres around Australia, and we all participated in it, in which we compared two ways of removing iron. Basically, blood was removed from patients with hemochromatosis, and we either then remove the red cells, which contain the iron, or we remove the plasma, which doesn't contain much iron. And patients participating really didn't have any knowledge about which way we would flick the switch at the time. And that was a way of ensuring that there was no bias that occurred because people thought they were having one treatment or another. But what we found is that if we provided uh, iron removal treatment to patients with hemochromatosis who had ferritins between 300 and 1,000, that there was a significant improvement in fatigue and also cognition, the way your brain works, with iron removal that wasn't seen um, in individuals who didn't have iron removal. There was also improvement in some of the oxidative stress markers in the plasma, and this led us to conclude that all patients who are homozygous for C282Y or have home hereditary hemochromatosis with an elevated therapy should have treatment whether they feel well or not, because you don't know how unwell you are until you've been treated. And I've seen that very often in patients with all sorts of diseases. The next thing is, are there any other ways that doctors can try and ascertain patients with hemochromatosis? Everyone's aware of the role of the iron studies that we perform and gene testing, but are there any other tests? We've known probably for over 20 years that there was a report way back in the early 2000s that the size of the red blood cells in patients with hemochromatosis seemed to be a bit little, uh, larger than normal. So we undertook a study here in uh, Western Australia, uh, which was published just two years ago now, where we looked at the size of the red cells in patients with hemochromatosis. And we looked in men and women, we looked in uh, young people who hadn't yet developed elevated ferritin, but who did have the hemochromatosis gene mutation, those who uh, did have elevated ferritins, those who had symptoms and signs of disease. And we even compared them with patients who had liver disease or arthritis or chronic lung disease uh, of causation other than hemochromatosis to see how good this simple test was. And as it turned out, it was actually pretty reasonable. And the bottom line here is, and we've built this into some of the health care pathways now that GPs use in Western Australia, is that if you have a full blood count, and there's about 12 million of them done every year in Australia, for whatever reason, and your mean cell volume is elevated above 94, uh, or your mean cell hemoglobin is elevated, then what we find is that uh, as many as 34% of all men and up to 62% of all women who end up having hemochromatosis will have that set of parameters present. So 
In other words, if you've gone to your doctor and you have a full blood count, uh, there's a bit more information that you can get off this very simple test that might point you down the direction of a pathway to get uh, checked further for hemochromatosis. And so this has become part of our medical education program and the pathway for hemochromatosis for GPs in WA to try and give them an extra tool to help find patients with hemochromatosis. The other big area that patients with hemochromatosis uh, often uh, suffer with is arthritis. We've been very interested in arthritis and work very closely with our colleague, Dr. Graham Carroll, who works at the Fiona Stanley Hospital with me. And we've been conducting a number of studies in patients with hemochromatosis and arthritis. And what we found is several things. First of all, that if you have uh, homozygosity or two copies of that C282Y gene, that your mean cell volume is not only higher in those with the gene, but if you've got arthritis, it's higher again. So it seems to mark a propensity to the severity of arthritis. Uh, and that mean cell volume isn't just a marker of arthritis in general, because if we compare arthritis in hemochromatosis with rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis of other causation, the mean cell volumes are never quite as high as we see in arthritic patients with hemochromatosis. So much so that if your mean cell volume is elevated again above a certain level, then it gives you a much greater risk for developing arthritis in hemochromatosis than patients who simply have hemochromatosis and a lower mean cell volume than otherwise you would see in the arthritis group. And then some work we're just doing at the moment and finishing off uh, with one of our junior doctors, James Chen and Graham Carroll, was to look at whether this mean cell volume is marking anything else with arthritis. And as it turns out, it does. So the more severe your joint disease, the more the number of joints involved, the higher your ferritin is, then the higher your mean cell volume is going to be. So it turns out that this simple little parameter on routinely ordered blood tests can be a quite useful test for profiling risk for arthritis in hemochromatosis. Um, arthritis has interested other groups as well. And for a long time, we've wondered what the role of transferrin saturation has been in hemochromatosis. Of course, we're always very keen to get the ferritin levels down into the low normal range with treatment, but it's always been very difficult to get the transferrin saturation down. And often people have asked, well, is that important or not? As it turns out, and this comes from the French group uh, published uh, back in 2017, that they showed in their large group of hemochromatosis patients that if you had transferrin saturation elevated over 50% for more than six years, generally speaking, patients tended to have more symptoms, more joint disease, irrespective of how low their ferritin's got. So it's a pointer in the direction that we need to come up with new strategies to try and get transferrin saturations down. The difficulty with phlebotomy is if you can't really do it terribly safely without overshooting and becoming iron deficient. And that's why now there's uh, companies interested in producing new types of iron chelation or medication for stop iron absorption therapies that will probably target transferrin saturation uh, better than ha has been done in the past. And there may be an opportunity over the next year or two uh, to uh, participate in clinical trials as these therapies uh, reach the point that they can be tried in humans. The other big area in hemochromatosis is hepatic fibrosis. And for a long time, we've wondered how can we risk profile patients with hemochromatosis for those most at risk of developing liver scarring? Because the liver disease endpoints that influence your health essentially only occur in all chronic liver diseases and specifically hemochromatosis if you develop scarring called hepatic fibrosis, which in its most extreme form becomes cirrhosis. So what we've shown and others have shown as well is that if your iron concentration in the liver which can be measured either invasively, which is not terribly often done these days with biopsy, or non-invasively with MRI scans, is over 200. And that's about seven times the upper end of normal. Then that can predict a higher likelihood of fibrosis. And if you can't have a scan before you get treated, but have been treated and want to know, did you possibly have advanced liver disease? Well, if you've had more than 9.6 grams, which is more than 38 units of blood, removed 
uh, over time uh, in a treatment cycle, so that is every one or two weeks for a period of time, then that can also predict whether you had uh, fi advanced fibrosis or not. What about simple blood tests to help diagnose hemochromatosis fibrosis? Well, as it turns out, um, there are some simple blood tests which are available. They're often used in patients with many liver diseases in the community and hospitals to try and risk profile and triage patients who don't have any chronic liver injury and those that do have chronic liver injury so we can follow them and investigate them more appropriately. Two simple blood tests available with, uh, to, G, to anybody actually, because they're purely derived from liver blood tests and a full blood count, are quite able to predict uh, the presence of advanced fibrosis. And these tests are called the ARPRI test, which is a ratio of one of the liver test enzymes to your blood platelet ratio. And the other is a more complex version of the same thing. It has four parameters, but you go online, plug the numbers into a little calculator and it comes out with a, a readout. Those two little numbers, which can be done off simple, easily available blood tests, can risk profile whether you do or don't have any significant hepatic fibrosis. Uh, more importantly, uh, the ARPRI test can be used to monitor regression as well. So if you have this little test done and then you have your treatment and want to know, did your fibrosis get better and don't want to repeat biopsy or aren't sure how to get further checked out, then that test can be repeated by a GP. So again, it's a simple little tool that will help you monitor whether your liver disease is present or whether it's got better. The risk of liver cancer, again, has been something that's been topical and goes back into the 70s and 80s when studies out of Europe reported an increased risk of liver cancer in patients with hemochromatosis. And we've often wondered in the modern era, does that risk still continue? Well, there was a lovely study out of the UK published in 2020 uh, using the UK Biobank, which is a study a cohort of nearly, well, just under half a million patients now with a range of diseases, but there's so many patients in that study cohort that they have lots of hemochromatosis patients. And what they did was ask the question, if you have C282Y homozygosity, are you at increased risk for liver cancer? Yes or no? And they're also able to take into account other risk factors that contribute, such as alcohol and body weight and smoking, etc. And what they found was quite interesting. For men, there's about a 7% lifetime risk for a liver cancer if you've got C282Y homozygosity. And compared with men who don't have C282Y homozygosity, the risk's 0.6%, so it's over a tenfold enrichment. Interestingly, though, in women, there wasn't an increased risk. So again, it sort of runs to the theme that men tend to be a lot more adversely affected compared with women when it comes to endpoints such as liver cancer. What has been happening recently that hasn't been published yet, but is also interesting, is we've developed on the theme of the little simple blood test to ask the question, there are a couple of other tests that are routinely used around Australia, but of which never been validated in hemochromatosis. Now that we've validated the APRI and the FIB4, the simple little blood tests in hemochromatosis, oh, there we go, go back to that. Um, we asked, do two other tests. One's called HEPA score. It's routinely uh, available in Western Australia and probably around the rest of the nation. The problem with that test is, whereas ARPRI and FIB4, are based on simple tests that are covered by Medicare and therefore to calculate the results requires no funding at all. HEPA score does engender a, a, a charge. And another test called elastography, which is becoming more and more used in liver disease, which involves special machines or nowadays, even your radiology providers that do simple liver ultrasounds can do this as well. What we wanted to know is, can these tests detect fibrosis in patients with hemochromatosis as well. So again, aimed at giving your doctor more choices of tests that they can run to tell you whether you do or don't have a liver injury. And what we found is the following, is that if you have hemochromatosis, whether you're a male or female, if your ferritin, the first question we ask is, is your ferritin above a thousand? If it's not, we know that the simple little blood test, the ARPRI and FIB4 are the most accurate. And if they suggest that there's no fibrosis, then you can go straight to treatment, don't need anything else done. 
If they're elevated, then we suggest further investigation, which might involve the liver biopsy or possibly one of these elastograms. However, if your ferritin's above a thousand, then your doctor has a choice of all these tests. They could do an APRI, a FIB4, a HEPA-score, or an elastogram, because they're all reasonably accurate in that setting. The important thing here is that you shouldn't be having an elastogram or a HEPA-score done to assess fibrosis if your ferritin's under a thousand, because they will miss most of the cases. And so that's some work we've just finished and have sent off to be published. So hopefully that will happen in the not too distant future. The next thing is, what's the relationship? Given that arthritis is common in hemochromatosis and liver disease is always of concern in hemochromatosis, are they in fact related in some way? And the answer is yes. So again, if we take males and females with hemochromatosis and ask the question, do you have arthritis, yes or no? If you don't have arthritis, there's a very low chance, shown in yellow here, that out of the total pool of hemochromatosis patients that you'll have severe liver injury as uh, reflected by advanced scarring. Conversely, if you do have arthritis, almost 30% of people with arthritis and hemochromatosis will have advanced scarring of the liver. So again, simply, if your doctor says, lift up your hands and show me whether you've got arthritis, that's a reasonable way of starting to profile you for risk of liver scarring or no liver scarring. So again, a simple, useful clinical tool. If we ask the question in the reverse way, that is, if you have advanced hepatic fibrosis, what's the likelihood you'll have arthritis? If you don't have fibrosis, again, about a third of people can have arthritis, but two thirds won't. But if you do have advanced hepatic fibrosis, the majority of patients will have arthritis. So again, it's another way of confirming that arthritis is a risk marker for liver scarring and vice versa. Another area of interest often for patients with hemochromatosis is their treatment and the veni section. And particularly the issue of if you go to the Red Cross and you have your treatment, but your hemoglobin's a little bit below the cutoff, often it's annoying, but from a safety perspective, it's easy to understand why the Red Cross might do this, that the treatment's deferred and, and someone waits for the haemoglobin to pick up. So we asked the question uh, whether there was any data that suggested this was safe or better or, or otherwise. So we did a study with the Red Cross and what we did was we looked at um, 30, nearly 35,000 therapeutic phlebotomies done in Australia um, uh, over a one year period. And we looked at the patients who'd had a phlebotomy above the threshold, which for men was 130 gram per liter and women 120, or those who'd serendipitously actually had a phlebotomy done under the threshold because the Red Cross can use its discretion to decide uh, whether to do it or not. And then we said, well, okay, did anything different happen to those groups of patients? And what had happened was that basically only about 0.01%, so a tiny, tiny fraction of patients who had treatment either above threshold or even below threshold, but I'll just point out that they were still above 100 gram per litre, but nonetheless, that's still lower than the normal cutoff, had any adverse events. So there's in fact no greater increase in risk for an adverse event from a phlebotomy therapy as long as your haemoglobin's above 100 grams per litre. So we now have data that supports this, and uh, in the future, we'll see whether or not this modifies any of the current, current treatment provision provided by the Red Cross. Some new work out in the last two years, again, which is done off the UK Biobank, that huge cohort of patients, has started to ask some very similar questions to what we were interested in some years ago in the work we did with Katie Allen, who of course is now the member for Higgins, uh, in Melbourne, uh, and basically looking at common manifestations of haemochromatosis. And, it, and quite reassuringly, you might remember some years ago, uh, we as a group of investigators in haemochromatosis ran a big study in Melbourne called the uh, uh, Melbourne Collaborative Cohort Study, and off that studied haemochromatosis and came up with the idea that 30% of men and less than 10% of women were going to manifest clinically with the disease. Uh, 
And what this UK study did was show that indeed about um, one in five uh, men, um, but about one in 10 women will develop clinical complications of hemochromatosis if they're untreated. And that's very similar to what we've seen. But interestingly, uh, when they look at this uh, data, and here we have a graph of men and women and common clinical manifestations that are sometimes uh, associated with hemochromatosis and sometimes aren't. What we see is that any point to the right of this line means an increased risk. So all these things here are an increased risk. Anything that touches the line or is very close to the line means there's no increased risk. So what we see is that in the UK Biobank study, that men who have hemochromatosis are at increased risk of all these things here. So liver disease, arthritis, pneumonia, diabetes, uh, but not so cardiac sorts of things. Interestingly, we do find increased tiredness as we found in the Melbourne My Iron study where we looked at phlebotomy. So sometimes different countries with different populations produce different data. But the other thing here is you'll notice for the women, all the lines overlap one or are very close to one except for the arthritis line. And so again, men seem to cop it in the neck a bit more than women with this disease. The pneumonia thing is interesting because back in the 90s when we ran the Bustleton population study uh, for clinical manifestations of hemochromatosis, we observed that if you carried the C2821 mutation, you had more admissions to hospital with lung complications from any disease than if you didn't. So this actually fits with what we saw about oh, almost 30 years ago now. There are some possible immune or infection related issues that come with hemochromatosis that can still manifest. The other thing the UK study confirmed again, consistent with what we've known is that it's the C282Y homozygotes that have the increased risk of disease. If you have the other genotypes, there's really not much increase in risk of any symptoms or signs of disease. So it's this genotype that we really need to make sure we always find all the other genotypes don't really manifest with a clinical endpoint that overall causes too much clinical trouble. As we all get older, the issue of does hemochromatosis influence our aging and things like frailty, muscle, loss of muscle, which sarcopenia is or chronic pain. And again, the UK Biobank have recently produced data along these lines as well. And whilst this is a busy graph, I'll just highlight a couple of things. The men and women differ in their manifestation of some of the age-related declines. And for men, frailty and weakness and loss of muscle bulk are definitely at increased risk if you have hereditary hemochromatosis. Chronic pain, again, not so much so, but in certain age groups as you become uh, over 65, that tends to happen in men. And for women, there's a less obvious sort of association with any of these parameters, because remember in these types of plots, any line that crosses this long dotted line means there's no association. So again, it just points to the fact that men are going to be much more adversely affected as they age by hemochromatosis than women. And then finally, just some interesting stuff, which isn't really about hemochromatosis, but is about iron and aging. Everyone's, as we uh, live longer and age, it's not that we always gain healthy life. For every year we gain roughly 70% of its healthy life and 30% unhealthy life. So we're more and more likely to develop chronic disease. And everyone's always interested in what are the factors that contribute to healthy aging. And genetics contributes about 10% to our lifespan. The other 90% is everything else other than genetics. So lifestyle, environment, disease, or everything else you can think of that defines the things we're exposed to with life. Now, interestingly, this was just published last year. And it's a busy graph. For those that want to go and read up the paper, you can do so, but it's very uh, tech, to put it mildly. But the point I want to make is this. This long line of little black squares here is a set of genes which they've found are very strongly associated with 
um, longevity, how long we live and how long we live in a healthy way. And all those genes happen to be related to heme or red blood cell metabolism. And the strongest contributing component to these genetic factors that contribute to the length of our lifespan happen to be related to some simple parameters. Serum iron, transferrin are the main ones here. And basically the story goes that as you get older, if your serum iron levels slowly increase, then it has a negative, it's shown here by the negative sign in front of the number, effect on your health span, so the years of healthy life you're going to have, your total lifespan, and how long we're going to live. Whereas the higher your transferrin gets, the more beneficial it is. So anything that keeps iron levels lower as you get older seems to be associated with living to a healthier, longer, riper age, not only in individuals, but also in their parents, so what the parental lifespan was. And this fits with a growing sort of uh, body of evidence in the literature that serum iron levels by themselves are not necessarily elevated, but in the upper end of what we take to be the normal reference range are associated with increased risks of disease. And the particular diseases that we know that have been shown are liver cancer and breast cancer in not only in Western populations, but Asian populations, it's a global sort of thing. So. Whilst hemochromatosis is the penultimate example of what happens with too much iron, the rest of the world needs to worry about iron, not only from the deficiency point of view, but really, should we all be running a slightly lower iron level than perhaps we'd otherwise accept to help us live long and fruitful and healthy lives? So with that, I'll stop and we can go to questions uh, and I'll stop sharing the screen there. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, that's a very interesting um, thing, a lot to take in there. Um, we have only one question at the moment. So if people have questions, if that's um, prompted some things you're thinking about, or even if it's just a more general question, you've always wondered about hemochromatosis, now's your chance to get in and ask. We do have one question to, to open with, John, and it's one that I've heard before. I have hemochromatosis, but my doctor tells me I have low iron. Can I take iron supplements as my doctor recommends? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, and the reason is, think of the analogy of your fuel tank. Um, if your fuel tank's empty, you fill it up. So if you don't have enough iron, that's just as bad as having too much iron. You need iron to produce red cells and every cell in your body to produce energy needs enough iron. So if you're running low on iron, you can't actually produce energy. And that's why people with low iron feel fatigued because they don't produce enough energy. So the answer is yes, as long as it's carefully monitored. And probably more importantly, why are you low in iron uh, is sorted out. Because the older we get, the more important it becomes to make sure that certain conditions are present that can cause us to lose iron that might be important for our health. Uh, thanks, John. Um, we've just had another question submitted. Um, when will the drug be available? Okay, so there are two or three companies out there making uh, treatments. Two, two treatments will be an injectable form of treatment. Um, they may or may not be targeted to hemochromatosis per se, they might even go into other iron overload or conversely iron deficiency areas. The oral drug, which is a chelator for iron in the diet and which essentially stops iron and basically only iron being absorbed, has been developed. It's, life, it's been um, proposed to the FDA to undergo a clinical trial and once that clinical trial approval has been given, so that's in the United States, um, we're actually going to run the trial in Australia. So we're in the, at the moment, we're just going through the logistics of working out how the trial's to be done, what centres, uh, funding for these sorts of studies, these work out in the millions of dollars, so who pays for what, etc. But once that's all sorted, then we'll be looking to recruit uh, patients with hemochromatosis who have been treated and are in their maintenance phlebotomy phase 
to see whether these drugs might not, are not only safe, but can drop your transferrin saturation and tackle the problem that's not tackled by, ferret, by phlebotomy, uh, which is to try and reduce that risk of other complications occurring. So probably within the next 12 months, I would imagine that we would be doing this and I would anticipate coming back to Hemochromatosis Australia to sort of publicise that more widely and then look for uh, potential participants in the study. So again, it can be something that Australia can do and lead the way in. Great, thanks, John. Um, another question from Ben. We've known about the um, association between osteoarthritis and hemochromatosis for some time. Could you speak about more about the relationship with rheumatoid arthritis, please? Yeah, so that's a good question. Sometimes what's called rheumatoid, what's called osteo, and I've become more aware of this ever since I've been working with Graham Carroll. You know, Graham, you know, essentially what the rheumatologists say is that it's, it's an osteoarthritis type of disease that you get with hemochromatosis. It is still possible if you've got hemochromatosis to get rheumatoid arthritis because there's still reasonably common enough prevalence of them in our community for there to be an overlap of both conditions sometimes in people with hemochromatosis. And a good example is I see patients with hemochromatosis who not only have hemochromatosis, but they have celiac disease or other diseases as well that are genetic and highly prevalent in populations of Northern European descent, which is where we come from. So it's more likely to be a coincidental, coincidental a concurrence of two unrelated conditions when you have rheumatoid and hemochromatosis. But if you've got the osteoarthritis and it's the typical pattern that you get in hemochromatosis, then that is the one due to the disease. The problem with the disease and the arthritis that goes with it is no one's really sure what causes the joint damage and injury, if it's the iron or something else. And what we think by finding this association with the blood cell size and the arthritis is whatever's driving this change in the way the cells behave in response to iron is the same thing that's probably driving the arthritis. And it's not necessarily just the storage of iron, it's something else. And that's where we're now trying to get to uh, with this sort of research work. Okay. Um, we have a question from Barbara. Is is it harmful to use Mancuvision sure, with vitamin C if C282Y, but trying to manage potential macular degeneration? So I assume Mancuvision is a, a drug or a, um, yeah. a treatment. Okay. Yeah. So there are some um, eye diseases, and again, I'm not an expert in eye diseases, that have been associated with the presence of hemochromatosis. But... The eye, again, the principle should be uh, to minimize exposure to ferritin and to transferrin saturation. Ferritin you can manage with phlebotomy, but transferrin saturation often reflects what's being absorbed from the gut, simplistically. So if you're taking a, an iron supplement and or something with vitamin C, you're going to always absorb more than if you don't take vitamin C. So essentially, if your transferrin saturation is normal and you have hemochromatosis, then you probably don't need to worry too much. But if your transferrin saturation is above the upper end of the reference range, even if your ferritin is normal, anything you can do to help hold that lower than otherwise it might be is good. So avoid vitamin C in your supplements at that point. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Ross. If the condition is genetic, then why does it take so long to present? As well, what are the epigenetic environmental factors that contribute to the condition developing? Ah, good question. So you would think that if this was a single gene responsible disorder, you either did or didn't develop problems and people would recapitulate fairly faithfully what happens. But I'm sure somewhere behind all this, the man who designed us must have been speaking to Elon Musk because there's so many redundancy systems that are present in our body that can regulate iron transport and absorption apart from the hemochromatosis mutation that the explanation probably relates to the fact that 
For example, one in three of us has a variant, that means a different efficiency operation of how we absorb iron from the gut run by some different pathways, which when they're present, uh, will significantly either reduce or when they're absent, increase iron absorption. So once you start developing, you've got a problem with HFE, you add in these other variants, and that's only one of the, there are many other pathways that vary between us as well. You actually have to have all the um, holes in the Swiss cheese as they use in risk management sort of parlance lined up for you to actually develop the clinical problem. So thankfully, we've actually got a number of fail safe pathways which prevent development of iron overload, even if otherwise your iron sensing system is not right. And a good example of how that works is if you take iron tablets, you've probably heard, spoken to friends who've taken iron tablets and say, all I get is a bellyache or they don't work. Within 24 hours of taking an iron tablet, your body has sensed the iron and turned off iron absorption just in the gut. Nothing to do with HFE or the protein that we're talking about mutated here. So our body has other ways of sensing iron and can regulate how much iron comes in apart from the hemochromatosis. Then if you look at men and women, well, there's some reproductive cycle differences uh, between us that contribute to lower iron status over a longer period of time in women. So all of those different genetic and sometimes environmental factors and the main environmental factors are what's in our diet. So for example, if you have a more vegetable heavy, fruit heavy diet, you might still think there's lots of iron in the food you're eating, but the biological uh, structure of the iron containing uh, compounds in that food prevents the iron being released. So you could take the same amount of iron in meat as vegetables. You might actually have to eat a ton of veggies, but uh, you would always absorb much more iron from meat or heme containing sources than vegetables. And then there are things in fruits and in uh, other things such as tea, which actually inhibit iron absorption. So once you start taking all those environmental factors into account, again, it adds to why there's variance. And then finally, epigenetic effects. Um, epigenetics is becoming a growth area. There's so many different other ways the body can regulate how various genes, i.e. The, the, the little computer sort of programs that control what we do and don't do work, that that's an evolving field. And I've got no doubt there'll be something there, but it's still a bit early to say much more on that. Okay, there's a couple of questions that you've partially, I think, or perhaps even answered in the last um, answer was, um, does diet have any importance to HH? And also, are there any dietary measures to collate iron? Yeah, so, I mean, at the moment, there's no effect of iron chelation orally. There are chelators that are used, but they actually work because they get absorbed from the gut, go into the body, chelate iron or excreted through the urine or the poop. Uh, and they're used to treat um, patients with uh, usually secondary iron overload disorders. Um, the uh, other things about diet, so essentially if you think about it, from our diet each day, we normally absorb somewhere between one and two milligrams per day if it's um, uh, a normal, if you're a normal individual. Uh, an untreated hemochromatotic possibly could go up to 10 milligrams a day. When you donate a bag of blood, you're giving out 250 milligrams. So essentially, there's so much more blood we can take out with phlebotomy than interfere with via changing your diet. That the general rule of thumb is you eat uh, normally, you avoid uh, vitamin C, uh, and you treat the iron overload with uh, phlebotomy. And then when we get new drugs to manage iron absorption, then we'll introduce those because it's too hard to manage it otherwise. But certainly things like tannins, um, and vegetable sources of iron will be less bioavailable iron than if you take meat sources. But there's no reason to stop eating meat just because you've got hemochromatosis, unless you want to for other reasons, of course. Okay, thanks, John. We've um, still got a few questions to go. I'll try and quickly run through a few more, but we might need to cut it off then. But we will give people a, a chance to submit questions after the, the webinar, and we'll attempt to answer them. I can't guarantee that John will be able to answer all, but we'll triage them and some of them will be fairly clear already that we know about. Um, one from Sky, what levels do you consider 
a person with HH should be aiming for? Uh, generally, at treatments, uh, aim for 50 to 100 in terms of ferritin. Cool. Uh, one from Natasha. This may be too basic. There's no basic, too basic question. But I am recently diagnosed and don't understand the transferrin saturation and iron difference balance. Well, I guess it's the where transferrin comes into it and what it's all about. Okay. Think of it like this. Ferritin, and this is to use Katie Goot's description. I don't know if Katie's online, but I thought it was really good. Think of ferritin as money in the bank. Think of transparent saturation as money in your pocket. So it's what transparent saturation is what's spinning around in your body at any one point in time. And it may or may not necessarily reflect what you've got in the bank. So uh, that's the easiest way to think about it. And usually transparent saturation is a measure of what's coming in from the gut and what's being released from your iron stores into the circulation. Um, and so if it's high, it means you're carrying a lot of the extra cash around. You know, you've got a lot more iron flipping around in the circulation that can react with things. But if your ferritin's uh, low or normal, then you've got little or normal amounts of uh, iron stored in the marrow ready for a rainy day and for producing um, blood cells and things. Remember, each day um, we use about 20 or 30 milligrams of iron to make new blood cells, for example, but we only need to absorb one or two from the bowel. Uh, and that's because we recycle intensively the iron that we use we, is, is released from cells that are dying within our body and just use it to make new cells with. So it's the ultimate in green carbon neutral approach to life. Okay. Um, we might just wrap up with a couple of very quick last questions. And then, as I said, people will have a chance to um, to submit. We'll, we're sending out an email afterwards and you'll have a chance to respond with a, with a question if you have any more. Um, sure. This is a really interesting one here, I thought, from Elaine. Are there any benefits from having hemochromatosis? Uh, there are. So, you know, um, Elon Musk, or who the man who designed us, or the woman who designed us, wasn't necessarily... Uh, disliking us by giving us the HFE mutation. So if you go back 5,000, 6,000 years when the average lifespan of an individual was about 30 before he got hit over the head by a Celt or died of plague or something like that, one of the biggest issues at that point was iron deficiency. And of course, that influenced your ability to reproduce, survive disease, run away from angry Celts. So those who have C282Y are less likely to be iron deficient uh, and the more you, so if you go from one C282Y to two C282Ys, and especially in women, the prevalence of iron deficiency um, almost declines away to nothing. So it, it protected against iron deficiency at a time when we didn't live long enough to the, suffer the sequelae of um, rusting, which effectively hemochromatosis is. And in the same way as if you keep a car for a long period of time, it will gradually rust. Well, now we're living two to three times the lifespan we had before. What was a good thing in the early days has now become not so much of a good thing. But again, C282Y carriage without having two copies does protect, especially women, against iron deficiency. Okay. And one last one, I think, which is a, a nice one to wrap up on. Uh, my 18-year-old son has just been diagnosed with hemochromatosis. He has only just had his bloods done, so his therapy is yet to be established. What is his prognosis if he starts phlebotomy, et cetera? For your information, I'm a 60-year-old male with pernicious anemia. Oh. Yeah, again, that just highlights that there are uh, lots of other conditions that are common enough in our community that often they'll overlap. But the bottom line is early diagnosis, treatment and maintenance of your iron stores in the normal and uh, at, uh, at the gold standard is low normal range between 50 and 100 is associated with normal life expectancy. Okay, um, sorry, I did say it was the last one, but there's one more that I thought might be worth asking. Is giving blood enough to treat my hemochromatosis? Sorry, say again, uh, Tony? Is giving blood enough to treat my hemochromatosis? At the current point in time, the answer is yes, but into the future, when we have better ways to target the transferrin saturation, that might change a little bit, but for now, it is enough to treat the hemochromatosis. 
But don't forget that that's treating, if you like, the iron component of this. If you've developed any clinical problems like arthritis or liver disease or anything else, then those problems themselves should be being managed through a person clinically qualified to deal with those other problems for you as well. Okay, thanks, John. I think that um, it's also an interesting thought that there's no cure for hemochromatosis, but the treatment is very effective. So, um, Okay, well, thanks, John. As I said, we'll, I'm sorry, people, we couldn't answer every question, but we got through quite a lot. And um, I think we better hand back to, to Liz now to um, conclude the session. Please hang around for just a few more minutes. We've got some important messages for you after this. So thanks, John. You're welcome. Thanks, John, and thanks, Tony. There were some really interesting questions there. So and remember what Tony said, you can submit them and we will, we will endeavour to answer them.